start off today, I want to ask you a question that really is probably off your radar, um, but, and some of you guys are going to be so disappointed. We had to make sure all the, the little kids are out of the room, so, uh, and hopefully none of you big kids really have this problem, but when was it, when was it that you discovered that Santa Claus wasn't real? Some of you are like, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, really, seriously. When is it, and I, I mean, think about this question, when was it that you discovered, now, I had a hard time when I asked myself this question, I really couldn't answer it, because my parents never really went the whole Santa Claus route, I, I, there's never a time that they played that game, they talked about Santa Claus, but everybody in the house knew it was them, and so uh, um, that was the whole deal, and no, it wasn't because it was a Bah Humbug family, this, my parents didn't go that route. Um, but I was, I was uh, listening to this pastor tell his story, uh, sort of prompted my thinking back a while ago. He talked about the fact that uh, they always celebrate Christmas and played the whole, you know, Santa's going to bring you gifts and all that kind of stuff, and that's cool. Um, and he said his, his youngest son got to be about five or six years old and came and had a talk with him one December and said, Dad, I'm not really sure that there is a Santa Claus. That's a pretty deep conversation when a five-year-old, six-year-old comes and has that with you. He said, I, I, I just don't think there is a real Santa Claus. I sort of doubt that he really exists. And then he went into his explanation, which this pastor said was just phenomenal because he had done research for five and six-year-olds. He had done research. He started quoting things on Google, and he quoted all these other things, and he said, Dad, I think you and Mom really are Santa Claus. I mean, I, he said he didn't know how to answer him, and it sort of saddened him because he, he wanted his son to have that simple childlike like, belief um, of Santa for a little bit longer because, you know, when they grow up, it's, Christmas this isn't as fun when the kids get older. You, and some of you guys are realizing that now as your kids are getting out of their years. Um, it's, you know, we complain when we've got kids and we have to put together all the little uh, toys and stuff for them, but those are some of the best days. They really are. And, so, and that's why you get grandkids, because you can do that again. Um, so that's an awesome thing. We're back to shopping for ki kids' toys again, and that's, you know, that's awesome about Christmas. But, you know, I think we have this problem just like so many of us um, who, you know, we still for a long time held on to that belief of Santa. I think many of us in our spiritual lives, many of us, um, many of us get this childlike view of Christmas and we hold on to it. A childlike view of Christ and, and we never really grow through our doubts. This young man, as this pastor told the story, his son had grown through doubts about Santa Claus and, and he, he was growing up and uh, certainly that made his dad sad because he was growing up, but in the truth, we're all supposed to grow up. In fact, I think for a lot of us, one of our problems is that we don't grow up into this adult-type doubting system of Christ and Christmas. In fact, I, I said this in our Sunday school class this morning, and it's going to be one of the key themes through the series. If you think Christmas, and, and listen to me carefully, if you think Christmas is about a baby in a manger and not a king on a throne, then you need to begin to doubt a little bit more honestly doubt and find out who really is Christmas about. Because he's not a, a child in a manger. He's a king on the throne. And today we're going to talk about the subject of, I doubt he is king. I doubt he's king. You know, when we talk about this, and it's probably amazing that somebody would say, uh, I don't know if you've ever sat in a church where a pastor told you like, hey, you need to doubt in, in your belief system. You need to start doubting. Um, I'm here to tell you that. A lot of churches say don't doubt. And that's the problem. I think if we used the microscope of doubt and, and helped us understand, we, we, it would do a lot for our faith this Christmas season. It would do a lot to change how we believe and who we believe about. 
In fact, as, as we get started today, let me give you some foundational truths that we need to understand about doubt, some simple just truths as we get into this today that will help us throughout the series. First of all, the reason we doubt is we doubt because we are not God. If you didn't know that, now some of you here, you've been, you've been in church so long, you're like, I never doubted. Yeah, you did. In fact, the only person to have never doubted was God. And, and if God ever doubted, he wouldn't be God, right? We doubt because we're not God. And if, if you're here, you're like, you've been told all your life, don't doubt, don't doubt, because that shows your weakness. That's not true. See, we doubt because we're not God. That's the truth. And it's okay to doubt because it doesn't hurt us. It certainly doesn't hurt God, and, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But we doubt because we're not God. And we may have forgotten that. We may have forgotten there was a time that we were sinners and we forgot who God was and we weren't sure about it. In fact, there might be someone here that's watching either on the, the internet or maybe you're here today and you grew up in church and you've been coming for a long time. Uh, maybe your parents were the ones who brought you and you've just followed in their footsteps and you're not sure, like, I'm not so sure about this whole thing. I'm not sure why we go to church on Sundays. And then it comes to the Bible, and you're not sure about the Bible. And yet you've been told, don't ask questions, don't doubt. And I'm here to tell you the opposite, doubt. Ask questions. Ask questions. I'm not scared of that. Ask some questions. Hey, you know what? Here's the truth, too. Because when it comes to doubt, there's some crazy stories in the Bible that can cause you to doubt. I mean, you can talk about, and this is something that, that has been debated over for a long time, about uh, Evolution versus creation. Hey, you know what? You can have some doubts in there. You can have some doubts in there. You can have some doubts about whether Jonah actually got swallowed by a fish or not. And some of the people that have been going to church for all their lives are like, oh, I, can't, I can't believe our preacher saying that. You can have some doubts because that's a pretty amazing story. You can have some doubts about the sun standing still. You can have some doubts about other things. But what we want to do is get to the point where you don't doubt who God really is and what he actually did because that's what matters the most. And that's what really is about, Christmas is about. Because we doubt because we're not God. And God doesn't have to doubt, which brings me to the second thing I wanted to share with you today. God, God is not threatened by our doubt. <laughs> Isn't that great? Maybe you've never thought about this one either. But God is not threatened by our doubt. See, you don't change God by your doubts. You change yourself. Did you get that? Your doubts don't threaten God. They don't change who he is. Hey, let me just say this, and, and listen carefully, because if I get misquoted, it's because somebody didn't listen to what I'm saying. Your doubts about God. If you're a person who believes in, in God, and God doesn't really exist, let's go to that hypo, hypo, uh, hypothesis, right? If you believe that God exists and God doesn't really exist, and you want him to appear right here today, it's not going to happen, Right? But let me just say this too, to be fair, because i got to go both sides. If you're an atheist and you don't believe in God at all, you don't believe it exists, that doesn't change that God exists either. See, what you believe, whether you doubt or don't doubt, doesn't change who God is. And you may have thought it did, and, and there, are, there are people uh, who are self-proclaimed uh, intelligent people who say there is no God. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't threaten God. See, your doubts only change you, only challenge you, only make you different. They don't make God different. And that's what's great about our God. <laughs> in fact, if you think about it, we live in a world where we have to, uh, we have to settle doubt, right? You, do, you settle doubt all the time. If you watch TV, you read newspapers, you talk with anybody on this planet, you're on social media or any of these things, you are settling doubt all the time, Right? Somebody comes to you and says some kind of crazy story, and what do you have to do? You have to decide, do I doubt it or believe it, right? Every day of your life. Every day of your life. Come on. This is a crowd participation day, right? <laughs> shake, my, shake your heads or something with me. Help me out if you understand what I'm saying. For instance, let me throw out some things, and you either yell out, help me out on this one, and don't make Dwight do it by himself. Either yell out, I doubt it or I believe it. Okay, so I'm going to make a statement, you either, and wait till I'm done, and you're either going to say, I doubt it, or I believe it. Let's give you an easy one. Hey, Congress is going to balance the budget, and we're going to be debt-free next year. Good, you guys are paying attention. Hey, the pastor is going to grow long hair. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, there you go, thanks. 
We settle down all the time. You know what? Your friend comes to you and says, hey, look at this YouTube video. And in your mind, you may not tell your friend this, but in your mind, you're either going, I doubt it or I believe it, right? And when it comes to God, every Sunday, when I stand here or Tracy or whoever's speaking, when I preach the truth at the invitation time, you know what you're doing? You're settling your doubt that day. You're settling out your doubt. You're really saying, God, I heard it and I believe it, or I'm walking out the same way I came in and I doubt you. That's how important this is. And yet, when we talk that way, I just want to make sure you're clear, your doubt If you walk out of here doubting what I'm saying today, it doesn't change who God is. But it does change who you are. You ever read the stories of some of these these famous atheists over the years of their life? A lot of them have one thing in common. They were all had some kind of tragedy in their early days of life. They grew up and, and something rocked their world, changed them. And those circumstances of their life caused them to come back and say, you know what? There is no God. I doubt he's there. I doubt he exists. I doubt those things. Causes us to question those things. And it causes us, because of circumstance in our life, to act like there is no God. And, and these men have all declared there is no God. God's, in fact, you realize uh, out in Berkeley, California, years ago during the 60s, they declared God is dead. Did it change God? I doubt it. (laughs) I doubt it. But they felt like it did. The truth of the matter is it didn't change God. It changed them. It changed them. You ask yourself, I I, I mean, as bad as things were in the 60s, look at it to 2022. And you go, how did we get this way? Because when we doubt, it doesn't change God. It changes us. And we live in a world that is called to reconcile doubt every day. And the people you work with, the people you're going to be around at the holiday, everywhere you're at, they're sitting there going, I either doubt God or I don't doubt God. And I, I would say this as our third statement today, and this is so crux to what we're talking about, maybe, just maybe, maybe we should doubt more. Maybe, maybe we should doubt more. And what do I mean? You should doubt or you're, you're going to stay the same. You should doubt with an honest doubt. You should doubt with an honest doubt, just like that young boy who said, I doubt that Santa Claus is real, and he started looking at facts. He started checking things out for himself, so he came to his dad at the age of five, six years old, and said, Dad, I doubt Santa is real. Yet for so many of us, we sat back, and we say, and even sadder, we say, there's a God or there's not a God, but I'm not going to do any kind of honest research to see what God really is. And we just sort of move along with the flow of traffic. And we never reconcile our doubts. And I'm here to tell you, maybe we should do a little bit more doubt. And what, I, what I'm really trying to say, because I wrote this down, what, what, I guess what I'm really trying to say is, how come in today, in 2022, how come today it's okay to doubt God, but to doubt anything else that's said in the media or in culture is insensitive? <laughs> See, it's a curious thing, isn't it? And maybe you've never thought about this. It's a curious thing what we feel like we have permission to doubt and not to doubt today. Certainly my hair wasn't a, something you, 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 you didn't have a problem doubting. But when we talk about things that are a little bit more tense, it gets a little uncomfortable. For instance, I wrote these things down. And let me read some of my thoughts to you. How come the only thing we can doubt these days is God? It's okay to doubt what God says is right, good, and true, but we can't doubt what the world says is good, right, and true without being so-called insensitive. Mm. How come we can doubt the Bible, but we can't doubt scientists? How is it we can question the very definition of life, but not the rights of women who want to end a pregnancy because of inconvenience? How come we can doubt creation, but not evolution? But we just can't talk about that right now because we're not supposed to doubt science or so-called science. Why is it that we can doubt the biblical definition of a marriage but not the culture's views on same-sex relationships? These are true, aren't they? How come it's okay to doubt Jesus Christ and who he is but you just can't doubt 
Disney and what they say. Mm. You know, maybe there's something wrong when <clears throat> we kind of question the things that come about God and we don't question anything else. Shouldn't we be asking, honestly, shouldn't we be doubting more the things that the world says? When the world says, doubt God, but don't doubt anything we say, shouldn't that cause you and me to doubt a little bit more? And that's the truth. See, here's my point. My point is, doubt more. It really is. Put the view of the world's good, right, and truth through the same filter that culture puts their view of God and his word through. I'm not telling you to doubt just to doubt. I'm telling you to use honest doubt, to take time to research the facts, to check the evidence, to see if the tomb really is empty. That's what I'm telling you. But the problem really isn't about doubt. The problem never has been about doubt. See, the problem is that we don't doubt Jesus, we dismiss Jesus. That's the truth of our culture today. You want to know what's wrong in our, our world today? It's not that people really say, I doubt God, I doubt Jesus Christ, I doubt he's a king. It's that we dismiss him. And I'll show you what I'm talking about through Matthew chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. Matthew chapter 2. Now, if you're Sandra, you're already sitting there going, oh, he's going to preach the wrong message. He's going to preach the wrong message because he's going to Matthew chapter 2, and that's not about the birth of Jesus. You're right. She's 100% right. This is way after the birth, at least a year, maybe even up to two. Jesus has been born in Bethlehem, and we pick up the story. And when you read Matthew chapter 2 and you hear about these wise men, of course, tradition says it's three, but we don't know that. Um, there are three gifts, but we don't know how many wise men, probably more than three. But the Bible tells us a story, and you've got to ask yourself, why? Why would it tell us a story? What purpose would Matthew have to show us in Matthew chapter 2? And I think the story comes down to this ultimate beginning where Jesus is being presented and Matthew's purpose is to present, us as this, uh, present Jesus as the king, God the king, king of the Jews. In fact, he writes to the Jewish culture. But here in Matthew chapter 2, we pick up the story of these wise men, that, and, and we're going to talk about this. But what's even more important is God helps settle our doubt for us. Remember I told you it's important. We go through a world that settles doubt all the time. And in Matthew's writings here, Matthew takes us through four signs. Now, when I say the word signs, if you were in our Sunday school class, you understand exactly what I'm saying, because that's the word that John used, signs. Miracles, or really roadmap signs, here is what we're talking about here. Some evidences. In fact, Matthew is going to give us four prophecies. Now, there are over 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ being born and being the Savior, the Messiah, throughout the Bible that are all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But today, and that's a miracle in itself, but today we're just going to talk about four of them because what I want you to do is I want you to understand why Matthew's writing what he's writing. Because God wanted to help you, to me, and every other person. So if you're an unbeliever today, I'm inviting you into this. If you're a believer, I'm inviting you into this. Because there are basically two groups of people here listening. You're either a believer or an unbeliever, and that's okay. Either one's great. As believers, we have accepted these truths, but sometimes we forget what they were. And God knew that we would struggle because even if you are a believer today, there was a day that you didn't believe. And you had to come to that belief in Jesus Christ being not a baby in a manger, but a king on a throne. And that's what's great about Christmas. Christmas is the beginning of the celebration of Jesus Christ being a king on a throne, not a kid in a manger. Matthew understood that. And so through God, Matthew gives us four signs that are actually going to be locations, four of them that are just so amazing because all four of them come from prophecy fulfilled. So in Matthew, we find the first one, and if you're taking notes, these are four places you got to write down. Number one, Bethlehem. Bethlehem, that's the first place. We pick up in Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible tells us after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Say it with me. Bethlehem. Bethlehem in Judea. During the time of King Herod. Now, the strange thing is we get here, there's already a king. Problem, isn't there? What king is comfortable with another king? No, there's no king ever comfortable with another king. So that's the situation we face. After Jesus, by the way, after Jesus, that's important. After Jesus is born, not at his birth, but way after, that means a time period afterwards, sometime between a year and two, they're still living in Bethlehem, that is, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod. 
King Herod was not a good guy. In fact, he was a monster. You say that, we're going to find out later what kind of monster he really was. But just so you know, he wasn't a good guy that we all want to celebrate. King Herod was a monster. He had no problem killing his own family members for his own personal gain. Now, some of you are like, yeah, I've been at Thanksgiving, so I can understand that. <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but no, I'm, I'm serious here. King Herod was a monster. He killed at his own will for his own purposes whenever it suited him. And so he is a, a despot of a king. Magi, wise men we call them, magi from the east came to Jerusalem. These are people who probably came from as far as maybe India, um, uh, maybe as near as, as um, uh, modern-day Iraq, Iran, that area. Um, they were people who studied the stars, and so they see something strange. Verse 2, it says, <clears throat> these magi, they asked, where is the one? Oh, this is not good, right? If you're the king and you're being asked, where is the one, and it's not you, that's going to make you a little bit upset. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Someone else was born king of the Jews. Herod actually held a title that said, I'm the king of the Jews. That's what he fancied himself. In fact, Herod did a lot of great things. He built the temple there. Um, he did a lot of renovation projects. He considered himself a man of the people, even though he killed a lot of them. Here we are where we find Herod being confronted with the truth that there's another king. Now, no one came to him and said, Herod... Where's this baby in a manger? They came to him and said, Where is the king of the Jews? And the king sits on a throne. And they said, We saw his light, his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Verse 3, When King Herod heard this, he was happy. Threw a party. Said, Let's celebrate. I'll give up my throne any day, right? No. He was upset. He was disturbed, distraught. He was angry. He was disturbed and not just him, but notice it says there, and all Jerusalem with him. You know, when Herod's upset, everybody's upset. And that's how he made life for everybody. And that was the scary part. Verse 4 goes on to say, in verse number 4, when he called together all the people's, notice it says that, the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Now, if you read verse 4, what you just understood is that Herod, he understood who Jesus was. He didn't think of Jesus as some baby. Who did he think of him as? The Messiah, the king. He understood the threat to his, and it's so important you get that. He understood, so therefore he had to, to, to change his view on things. He was distraught, he was disturbed. Because he understood who Jesus was. Verse 5 says, in Bethlehem, that's what they tell him, in Bethlehem, that's the location once again. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet, that is the prophet Micah, if you didn't know that, Micah chapter 5, verse number 2, um, for this is what the prophet has written, and then he goes ahead, and they quote the prophet, says, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And that is a hard thing to remember there. Um, that's so tough. Here's, here we find this first sign. And, and remember, we're going to give you four signs that are going to lead us to who Jesus really is because they were doubting. In fact, the people were starting to doubt that Jesus was the king all through his time. But here we have a king who believed he was a threat. See, Micah gives us this prophecy, and this is the first sign that God gives. And you realize Micah wrote 700 years before Jesus ever came on the scene. 700 years. Maybe you never knew that, but it was seven, around 700, 722 uh, B.C. that Micah writes that prophecy that out of Bethlehem will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The first sign that Matthew introduces us to so we can help examine whether Jesus really is that king or is he just a baby in a manger is the fact of Bethlehem. That's number one. But one's not enough, is it? So we keep going. The second place is Egypt. Egypt is the second place talked about, and we skip down. Um, now, I'm going to skip through the story of the facts of what happened with the Magi. They are warned to not go and tell Herod what Herod had asked for because Herod was not going to be a nice guy. So we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 2, verse number 13. It says, when they had gone, that is the wise men, the magi, 
An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and the mother and escape to Egypt. Say it with me. Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to make him co-regent. Right? Herod's going to search for the child to kill him. (laughs) Why would he want to do that? Why would Herod want to kill a baby? Because Herod believed Jesus to be a baby in a manger? No, a king on a throne. Do you get it now? Herod believed that. In verse 14 it says, So he got up, and he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. Verse 15, Where he stayed until the death of Herod, And so was fulfilled uh, what the Lord had said through the prophet. This is the prophet Hosea, by the way, if you want to know who it was. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Out of Egypt I called my son. So the second prophet, and there again we look back and realize hundreds of years before Jesus ever comes on the scene, before anything ever happens, before shepherds are introduced by angels to the story of Jesus being born, before an innkeeper says there's no room in the inn, before anything ever happens... The Bible tells us through a prophecy that God had given so that when we got here to this point and we say, I doubt he's the king, we could look and hear this prophecy that happened hundreds of years before that said, hey, you know what? He's going to Egypt. That's the second sign, second roadmap, right? See, and here's what's great about it. What I pointed out in verses 13 through 15, if you didn't catch it, Herod believed the sign, See, if it wasn't something to be believed, why would I care? Herod would have just gone about his own business, but he was trying to kill, kill Jesus. See, Herod wasn't trying to kill a baby in a manger. He was ca- trying to kill a king that would sit on a throne. That's what he was trying to do. And so Herod believed it, and because he believed it, Jesus had to go to Egypt, which leads us to our third sign. And our third sign is a place called Ramah. Ramah, we keep reading in verses number 16, <clears throat> through 18, it says, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, it, it, it does not, uh, now I laughed when I read that. Some of you guys like, I don't get what's so funny. He was outwitted by wise men. Well, hopefully he wasn't outwitted by dumb men. I mean, <laughs> I'd feel worse about myself if I was outwitted by dummies, but these are wise men, they're Magi. So I wouldn't feel so bad about being outwitted by those guys, you know? He was outwitted by the Magi. He was happy, right? No, he was furious. Why was it? Ask yourself. There again, we're using doubt. Why did this happen? Why was he furious? See, everybody else in this world that we live in today is saying, no, there's no Christ in Christmas. It's just happy holidays. There's no baby in a manger. There's no king on a throne but yet they're trying so hard to stamp out the Christ of Christmas. Why? Ask yourself, why? Why? It's the same reason that Herod is furious, and he gave order to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old. By the way, that validates what I've said about Jesus not being a little baby. He was a toddler at the time. Two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi, from the wise men. In verse 17, says, then what was said through the prophet, and he tells you this one, the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. So this is Jeremiah, hundreds of years before Jesus ever comes on the scene, a voice is heard in Ramah. Say it with me. Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. You see, we get to this, Herod believed it. That's the truth. Herod believed it so much. See, Herod wasn't threatened by a kid. He was threatened by a king. Herod believed this to be uh, true in his life, so he acted upon this truth. And because he acted upon this truth, Herod actually fulfilled the prophecy of the king. You know, if Herod was here today, I don't know what you would do, but I would, I'd be a little scared too, but I would like to ask Herod a question. I sit back and I put myself in these stories as I read through them, and I'd like to ask Herod this question. Herod, since we realize you believe this, this 
baby in a manger was actually king on the throne. You believed it to be true so much that you wanted to kill him, and you were willing to mass murder all the babies in this vicinity of Ramah, who were two and under. That's a horrendous thing, by the way. And when we ever get to the point where we think murdering babies is okay, whew, mm, what kind of society do we live in? But Herod, if you believe it's true, then Herod, why wouldn't it be better for you to bow? Why? Wouldn't you rather bow to the king than be at odds with this king? That's the question I would ask him. See, by trying to remove Jesus from this earth, by trying to stomp out this baby who would become a king on the throne, Herod actually fulfilled the prophecy that confirmed that he is the king of kings, the Messiah, the Christ of, of, of God. Which makes sense to, as to why people in America in 2022 doubt. See, we want, as a nation, to remove a baby in a manger. And it's not because we really doubt, is it? It's the same reason Herod wanted to remove a king. Because we don't want him to be king over us. See, it's not really about doubt. It's about dismissing Jesus Christ. That was the point, wasn't it? See, why would you, why would he, why would, why would our country be threatened by a baby in a manger? Have you ever asked that question? See, I think that's one of our problems. We don't ask enough of these questions. Why would we be threatened by a baby in a manger? Why is it retail stores have to say happy holidays and they force their employees not to say Merry Christmas anymore? Are they really threatened by a baby in a manger? No. Let's grow up in our Christmas thinking they're threatened by a king on a throne. And there are people probably listening today who, you know what, we don't want to acknowledge that Christ is the king because it changes everything. And we think if we could just eradicate him, make him a baby in a manger, make him not exist, that things will be okay, but they won't be okay, will they now? <laughs> we ought to doubt that he's king. See, why is it such a big deal to get rid of Christ out of Christmas unless, of course, there's something to it? Because Herod wanted to be king, he did everything to put a king to death. You know, that's, I think, why so many of us really doubt we just prefer to be king of our own lives. And that's what's really going on here. See, Matthew chapter 2 tells the story of a king who wanted to hold on to his kingdom. And the signs of the king coming were important. And that's why God gave him these, these signs, roadmaps. See, it's, that, it's not that people really hate that Jesus was born in a manger, because a lot of people love this time of year. It's the fact that it threatens their their rule. It's because it's not because there's a lack of evidence for who Jesus was. It's because we'd just rather be king of our own lives. Number four, the fourth sign. I told you I'd give you four today. Number four is Nazareth. In verses 19, we pick up the story. Verse 19 through 23, it says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared to, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Remember, he's down in Egypt. And he said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, that is Joseph, and he took the child, Jesus, and the mother and went to the land of Israel. Verse 22 says, But when he heard that Ericulus was reigning, that is, that's one of the sons of Herod, was reigning in Judah in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to... Go there, and having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to a district of Galilee. Verse 23, he went and lived in a town called, everybody, Nazareth. He lived in Nazareth. That's our fourth sign. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. There it is, fulfilled through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. <laughs> fourth sign. See, What's so great about this, if you didn't catch on, and maybe you're like, this is no big deal, I've read this a hundred times, but look at this, what did God do for us in our doubt? He knew that in, 20, uh, in 2022, people would still doubt whether he was the king, whether Jesus came just to be a little baby in a manger, or he came to be the king on a throne, and people weren't sure, and they would say things like, I doubt he's king, and you know what God did for hundreds of years before Jesus ever came on the scene, hundreds of years, different Prophets 
four different prophets, four different places, four different times, they gave us signs. Signs that came together that would all point that Jesus Christ is the king so that you, so that I would know who exactly we're dealing with. And you know what? Here's the truth. All you have to do to get this is be able to read the signs. To be able to read the signs. But the problem is sometimes we stumble at reading signs. Probably about 10 years ago, and, and, and I encourage you, if, you're, if you love to get on YouTube and find stuff, this is a hoot. To, for time's sake, I didn't do this. <clears throat> but if you get on YouTube, and maybe you already knew this, but go and Google Donna the Deer Lady. D-O-N-N-A. Donna the Deer Lady. If you've never heard her story, it went viral around our nation. Don lives up in, I believe it's in, in one of the Dakotas, somewhere up in the north. Um, she called in to this radio talk station. She was so disturbed, she was so distraught, had a problem that it, this became so viral, it went around, everybody was playing this and laughing so hard because it's sort of funny. But Donna was so serious because she didn't get this. See, in her little town, they put up in a very inconvenient place in Donna's mind, they put up a deer crossing sign. And when Donna calls in to this radio station, she calls in, she is not fooling, she is not playing, she is as sincere as could be. She calls in literally to say how upset she's been that her local government decided to have deer cross an intersection at this very busy place that was going to ruin everything for her. Now, some of you guys are slow and you're not getting it like Donna didn't get it. And you have to hear this. If you Take time. Google it and listen to it. Not during church, but listen to it on your own. Donna the Deer Lady, because it is so funny. In fact, it came out over and over again. But she spends three to five minutes discussing how that she has petitioned, and she's calling into this radio station to try and get the radio station to help her generate more people to sign this position, petition because she knows how bad it's going to be if the deer start crossing regularly at this spot where they put these signs. It's going to be a problem. It's going to cause traffic delays. And she doesn't understand why the government wouldn't put the sign somewhere else so the deer can cross somewhere else. You know, the problem with Donna is, as we all laugh about Donna, the problem with Donna is the same problem we have spiritually, is that we can't read the signs. You know why your neighbor doesn't go to church? Because they can't read the signs. And yeah, it's funny when we laugh about Donna, the deer lady, because deer crossings, that's pretty funny. But the truth of the matter is, in our own lives... When we look in the Word of God and go, I just don't get it what it says, and we don't take the time to read the signs, we're missing it. Because you know what God was doing? God was saying, hey, look, I gave you the signs that would make all the difference. See, the diff difficulty we have spiritually is the fact that it's not that there aren't any signs because God gave us signs. It's the fact that we're like, you know what? It's great to hear about this little baby at Christmas, and we put him away in a manger and then pull him out with our nativity scene every year, but he's just a baby in a manger. And the signs don't point to a baby in a manger. They point to a king on a throne. And that's how we should be celebrating Christmas. See, God, if he, if he was going to talk to us today about Matthew chapter 2, you know what God would say? He'd go, Woo! I just gave you four clear signs! I just told you about Bethlehem and Egypt and Ramah and Nazareth and all those four signs. You know what they do? They point to a king on the throne because that king changes everything. Amen. And we go, hey, let's buy some more gifts for ourselves because that's what it's really about. Let's put up bigger trees, more tinsel. And we forget it's not about a baby in a manger. It's about a king on the throne. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, Verses 10 through 12, Peter says this, concerning this salvation. Now, he's discussing these prophecies that are happening. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was co to come to you searched intently and, when, uh, and with the greatest of care. Verse 11, it says, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. In verse 12, it says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angel, even angels long to look into these things. And you know what he's saying there? Peter, in those three verses, if you didn't catch on what he's saying here, he's saying, you know what? He's talking about the purpose of this prophecy about 
the four signs here and, the, and all the different prophecies, the 300 and some odd prophecies about Jesus Christ that were fulfilled. And he's saying, you know, the prophets back in their time, they didn't get it either. And they longed to understand. When they wrote those prophecies back, Hosea and Jeremiah and, Je- and Micah, and all the other prophets, as the Isaiah, as they wrote about these things, a virgin will conceive and bring forth a son. They didn't always get it. They couldn't see what God was really wanting to do. And they, Peter here discusses the fact that they so intently wanted to understand, but it wasn't for them. You know what it was for is what Peter's saying? It was for you, for me. So that when we have doubts at Christmas time, when we have neighbors who say, you know what, I doubt that Christians are real. I doubt that Christmas is real. I doubt that Christ even exists. I doubt there's a God. I doubt that he's on the throne. We can sit back and go, yeah, but let me show you the signs. Because there are roadmap signs, and all you have to do is read the signs to find not a baby in the manger, but a king, a king on the throne, Amen. a king who, who can't be denied. Now we're blessed to understand, you know, Josh McDowell, uh, and and probably some of you have heard this before, Josh McDowell did a study years ago about these, and he said, out of those 300 and some odd prophecies about the Messiah, if you took just eight, all of them, by the way, have been fulfilled, but if you took just eight of those, for any one person to have fulfilled all eight of those prophecies is a number that's so big that makes our national debt look small. That'll get you an idea. It's a number that's so many, it's got, it's 10 to the 17th power. That's a lot of zeros. It would take me probably about three or four minutes to write the number on the, on the screen if I could do that. But I figure most of you aren't math people like I am, so it doesn't matter. Then he told this. He said, if you took silver dollars and you took, <clears throat> you took a number of silver dollars that equaled that number, that, that huge amount of number, And you took one of those silver dollars and you marked one silver dollar. And then you took those silver dollars and put them all together and and changed them around so you didn't know where any of them were. And you put them in an area the size of the state of Texas. It would be about two feet deep. And then you took a person, a man, and you told him to reach into that, blindfolded, mind you, blindfolded, reach into that pile throughout the whole state of Texas that's two feet deep with silver dollars and pull out just one silver dollar and that one silver dollar would be the silver dollar we marked, that would be the odds of one man, Jesus Christ, fulfilling eight, just eight, just eight of those 300 and some odd prophecies. And Jesus not fulfilled eight, he fulfilled 323 prophecies. And yet we're still going, hey, are you sure? Are you sure? (laughs) That's the truth. So basically, as we finish today, there are two types of people. I said that already today. Two types of people. There are believers and there are doubters. If you're a believer, that's great. Um, That's what we want to see. But remind you a couple things. First of all, if you're a believer, you once were a doubter. And you discover that God gives you good reason to dissolve doubt. And that's the miracle of Christmas, isn't it? <clears throat> so we as believers have every reason to celebrate Christmas. Therefore, our title. Let's celebrate Christmas this year. Who has a better reason to celebrate Christmas than those who already sta- understand the Christ of Christmas? But for you that are believers, let me start here. I want to throw out a little bit of caution to you. Because some of us, some of us maybe even sitting here today, you may have sat here the whole time going, that's great, preacher, but I don't really need this. I'm not, I don't doubt. And you say you don't doubt, but I want you to be aware that some of you, by your behavior, say you do doubt. That's the truth. See, you may not doubt with your lips, but you may doubt with your behavior. See, when your life and your behavior is inconsistent with the king and his culture, his kingdom. That is, how you handle your money, how you live in your marriage, how you proclaim your faith, how you live your life, how you love other people. What you're doing sometimes is communicating unbelief to a world that doesn't believe anyway. So it may be the question for us today as believers, what area in your life needs to come under the kingship of Jesus Christ? The other type of people today are doubters. And if you're a doubter here, let me just say, good for you. 
Keep doubting. Keep doubting. Honestly doubt, though. Hold the world's view of their truth to the same doubt that they use on Jesus and the word of God. Check it out. See, don't just dismiss Jesus because it doesn't feel convenient to you today. Look into the historical veracity of his story. Check out the evidences there. Find out what the Bible really has to say. Check out the signs and ask to read the signs. See, if you're a doubter and you don't believe, there's still hope for you. And that's what we're really all about during Christmas time. So let me finish with this. Two questions, or two statements. To those who are doubters, as we should doubt more, and that really is the theme of our sermon today, let me ask this. To those of you who are doubters, go through this holiday and ask, what else should you be doubting? What else should you be doubting? Don't just take everything that you see on the internet, see in the media, see in the news. Don't take it for truth. Doubt more. For those of us that are believers, the question we need to answer this, who are you, who are the, the doubters that you are helping in their doubt? See, the reason we really celebrate Christmas isn't so you can get more stuff this Christmas, so you can eat more stuff, so you can spend time having the perfect Christmas holiday music and lights and all that stuff. It's to help those who doubt read the signs. Because there are people out there that believe in the doubt of a king. They still think Jesus is a baby in a manger. And as I told you, Christmas isn't about a baby in a manger. It's about a king on a throne. Jesus as we go- Christmas, we should celebrate Christians should be more inclined to to be happy and celebrate this, not because of the gifts we're giving, not because of the food we're eating, and we're going to do all those things too, but because of the Christ who's on a throne. But if you're here today and you're a doubter and, and, and maybe you're listening online and you have never seen the signs that point to the Christ of Christmas, today's the day. We invite you to doubt more, to ask questions. In fact, we want to help you. That's what... This invitation time we're getting ready to start, it's our way of saying we invite you to doubt more. We invite you to ask questions. We invite you to to doubt the existence. Because if you doubt, you're open to the honest truth. And that would be Jesus Christ, because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That's the truth. And so today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, hey, if you're a kid, I was a kid who sat in church. My dad was a pastor. I sat there year after year after year, and I doubted things. And yet I was told to not doubt, just believe. Doubt, doubt's not good. And I didn't know that. So I'm asking you today, if you're sitting here today, hey, you know what? Doubt more. In fact, I would ask you to bring your doubt. Bring your doubt to me. I'd like to take God's word and show you just like we did in Matthew chapter 2, how you can know the truth. Let me show you the signs that are pointing to the Christ, who's the king. If you don't know Jesus Christ, and once again, it's not about religious stuff. It's not about baptism. It's not about giving. It's not about any of those other things. It's not about church membership. Those things are all good, but they're not what's going to get you into the kingdom of God. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal savior, today's the day out more. Bring your questions so we can give it answers. We like those questions. For most of us in this room, though, to be honest with you, most of us declare ourselves to be believers. And the caution I give you, believer, is are you really living like there is a king on a throne, or are you still living like there's a baby in a manger? Are you growing up in your faith? Have you asked the honest questions that cause you to doubt a little? Today's the day. Hey, What doubting person in your life, what person who doesn't know Jesus Christ can you lead to the signs? Because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what Christmas really is all about. It's not about you and your getting. It's about giving. And that's the truth. So help someone else celebrate a good Christmas this year by helping them with their doubt questions. 
Who is it that you need to pray for this morning? Who is it that you need to, God's putting on your heart? Who is it that you should be inviting to this Christmas series so they can hear the truth about a Savior that the Word of God points to? Who is it that you should be inviting to know the King on a throne? In just a moment, we're going to have the first invitation. I just want you to do what God's Word wants you to do, what God's Spirit's telling you to do, what God's impressing upon your heart. That's the truth. You're either going to walk out of here as a believer who's going to go out and tell others about the Christ of Christmas, or you're going to be the doubter who goes out there and lives the way you lived when you walked in the doors today, as if Christ is still in a baby in a manger, and that you can just put him away after a while. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the signs, the evidence that helps us with the doubt as we struggle. Because doubt isn't the, evidence, uh, isn't the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Doubt. Doubt is something that everyone has. And you embrace doubt. You embraced a guy named Thomas who was a doubter. And showed him the truth as you invited him to touch the nail prints in your hands. To, to touch the, the side where the spirit had gone in. Thank you for your ability to deal with us as we doubt. So God, today I pray you just help to change our hearts, change our lives. As we come before you in this time of invitation, I pray that your spirit would work in our lives, that you change hearts, change souls. And God, help us to doubt more so that we would live this Christmas in celebration of a king on a throne, not a baby in a manger. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to sing, Change My Heart, O God. You don't have to sing. What we need you to do is what God's talking to you to do right now. The altar's open. Are you going to doubt or are you going to believe as we sing? Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. the potter and I am the clay hold me and make me this is what I pray change my heart oh God make it ever my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You may be seated. All right, thank you all for coming. First of all, kind of struggling with the idea. So you believe, you adults believe, that my parents go to each house on Christmas Day to deliver your presents? No. Mama couldn't drive. Daddy only drove 45 miles per hour anywhere. Their car could be on fire, and he'd still be driving 45. How is he going to go to each one of y'all's houses for Christmas? Come on now. Come on. Seriously. Let me just doubt that. <laughs> All right. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for being here and worshiping with us. Uh, we got some uh, mission announcements, uh, ministry opportunities, if you will. Christians United for Southern Randolph, the food pantry for this, uh, for this time is grits, oatmeals, and canned meats, such as spam and the such. I love it. A uh, church-wide Christmas party at Caraway Saturday at 5.30. They would like for us to get there at 5.15 if that's possible. And uh, don't forget to bring your $10 gift uh, as well. I'd have it wrapped. You don't have to put your name on it or anything unless you want to be embarrassed. Anyway, and then uh, uh, next Sunday night we're having a business meeting. They're going to approve the budget for 2023, so please come for that. Uh, ladies for Christ, y'all got a Christmas party on Wednesday, December 14th at 6 o'clock. 
It's going to be at the Wildlife Center, uh, if you know that log cabin over there by the zoo. That's what it's called. All right. Uh, also, there are uh, uh, forums in the back if you would like to have a secret sister. Uh, go back there and, and sign up for one, or you can have one of mine. Kidding, Brenda. I'm just kidding. You know. <laughs> hey, love my sisters. Don't doubt that. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let us move on. <laughs> also, the Christmas music program will be on Sunday evening, December the 18th at 6 o'clock. Please try to come. I think afterward we're having food, right? Dessert, snacks, finger food, toe food, any kind of food you want. Uh, so please come for those. Uh, also, there's uh, the new uh, prayer uh, prayer thing back there. What do you call it? The prayer list? Prayer guide. Thank you very much. My mind went blank. There, uh, prayer guide is back there, so please get that. And it has all the stuff, too, that you might want to uh, see about and everything. Uh, as far as prayer requests, remember those who are shut in and cannot be with us today. And if you look around, you see quite a few people, so remember them in your prayers, if you will. Uh, remember those who are going through medical issues. We have quite a few of those, too, in our family. Uh, just keep praying for them and uh, uh, pray that they get through those procedures, but also I pray that you reach out to them and make sure they, that you know, they know that you're praying for them and that, that you remember them. So remember those. And this is also the, the, uh, MI, the IMB week of prayer for international missions. So remember that also. Uh, please uh, keep those in mind, all right? And our missionaries who are overseas may not be able to come and celebrate with their families. Think about them and think about all those and pray for them. Uh, as far as giving, uh, we want to thank everybody who's been faithfully giving. Uh, There's quite a few of you, and we thank you very much. Uh, today begins our international Christmas offering, our Lottie Moon. Uh, and so I hope you'll remember that. That goes to our international missions. And that goes to uh, taking the gospel throughout the world to everybody that, that we want to come to. Uh, and that goes uh, along with our giving. You can also give through Tidely. Uh, you can give through the, uh, the website, uh, WMSBCS. Seagrove. That's where I am. Hey. But anyway, uh, uh, just remember that. Now, the thing is, uh, we're, we were talking about uh, missions for offering uh, the offerings for missions and international missions. Uh, the thing is, is that a lot of times we, we, we have our wishes and we have our dues. Uh, we have a lot of times that we put our wishes over here, but what are we doing to, to match our, to get to that? Uh, I read here there's a blog, and this is what the man says. It's, uh, it's called Wishing and Doing. It says, by giving, by giving people more ways to speak up and more tools to take action, we keep decreasing the gap between what we wish for and what we can do about it. And that's a lot, that's a lot of truth to that. You know, we could wish for a new car, and then we work for it, and we get a new car. Uh, but, uh, but the thing is, we also wish for people to know Christ. We wish for people to come to know a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but what are we willing to do for that? And this is what the man says. He says, if you are not willing to do anything about it, best not to waste the energy wishing about it. You know, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of truth to that. If we don't give, uh, if we don't give an offering for our, our missionaries, then why are we wishing that, that the world would come to know Christ? You know, uh, we, need to put, uh, we need to put actions to our prayers. I guess that's what I'm getting at. We need to say, we need to believe in our hearts truly that the world needs Christ. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? And that's why I, I, I think, you know, you should pray and ask God, what should I give? What should I give? 
and that we should give according to God's grace and mercy. What has he given to us in that grace and mercy? All right, remember you can give through tithely, you can give on those other things, and we just thank you all for giving. And I pray that we would put our wishes into action to where they are done. All right? All right, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you, Father, and we thank you and praise you for everything you do for us, God. Lord, you are merciful and graceful. God, you are always giving, always loving, always there, dear Father. Lord, Father, we thank you, God, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for us. God, you wished that we could become children of God. So you did something about it. You gave the son, Jesus. Lord God, I pray that we would be willing to do the same thing for our friends and our neighbors and our families who don't know Christ. For a world who is lost in darkness, God. I pray, Lord, that we would use our giving as a light in a dark world. God, that we would use our lives to light the way in a dark world, dear God. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would help us this week, God, that we would show Christ to those who doubt, dear Father. Lord, that we would have them to look at the signs. Lord, let them, let them see for themselves that Christ is real. And he is on the throne, God. He came as a baby, but he's going to come back as something more, more powerful. God, I pray, Lord, that you would use us for your glory. God, remind us, Father, of how much you've given us. And let us give back just as much, dear Father. Let us give sacrificially, dear God, as you have given for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And God, I pray you'll be with us, God, and help us to love you and to serve you, to live for you every day. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a good week. And remember, we are having service tonight.